it's an amazing story of a woman that was determined, that succeeded against so many odds, and was this role model uh, when there were no role models. He's the man who wrote the book, the definitive book, on the late Tejano star, Selena Quintanilla Perez. Joe Nick Petoskey was probably in the best position of anyone in the state who could have written that book. He knew Selena from his days as a Texas Monthly writer. He had done a number of interviews with her and actually had to convince them that she was worth putting on the cover of the magazine, which then became one of its biggest sellers ever. He goes into great detail in this interview about what he knew of her from before and then what he found out in his research and his dealings with the family. Hope you enjoy this interview. Again, this is Joe Nick Petoskey, the writer of the book on Selena. I guess my introduction to Selena came by listening to her music and recordings. Uh, I have been writing about music since the early 1970s. And in the 1990s, I was a staff writer at Texas Monthly Magazine. And she was on my radar followed Mexican uh, American music in Texas, really going back to, I was interested in conjunto music, uh, to La Onda Chicana, which basically was the predecessor to Tejano. And then in the late 1980s, it witnessed kind of this explosion of Tejano music, a lot of bands coming up, not just Selena, but certainly Emilio, La Mafia, uh, Grupo Maz. These were all becoming big, acts, I mean, that were selling not just 10,000 records anymore, but over 100,000 units. They were getting noticed in the national media and by international record companies. So that by the end of the 1980s, you had all the major labels that had released Latin music were coming in to sign Texas acts, as well as all the bands were doing deals with beer companies, and most notably, Selena did a deal with Coca-Cola the first Mexican-American female, certainly in this part of the world, to do an endorsement deal with the number one soft drink in the world. And so, as a writer covering music, I would have had to have been blind for this to escape my attention. And I'd always liked, uh, I'd liked the regional music that came out of Texas. I was always following it. So I'd written about a feature in Texas Monthly about Little Joe, I'd written about uh, Steve Jordan, Esteban Jordan for Mother Jones magazine. So here, along comes Selena, and like I've seen, I've written about Flaco Jimenez. I've seen some people that I think are pretty significant, but when Selena started winning Tejano Music Awards and selling out the Alamo Dome for those awards ceremonies, drawing 50,000 50, people, and she's winning all the awards, that caught my attention. And I started listening to the music and following it. And I, to the point that in 1994, Texas Monthly Magazine is gonna start a new thing, the Texas 20, the 20 most significant Texans of this year. And kind of like, a, you know, to show that we're hip and in the know. And I was kind of the entertainment guy at the editorial board meetings. And understand, it's an all Anglo editorial board at the time. This is 1994. And when it comes to entertainment, everybody looks at me and it's like, well, who should we be doing? And I said, Selena. And everybody kind of gave me the, these blank stares. Who, huh? And I said, all you need to know is her last album has outsold ZZ Top and Willie Nelson. And that's really all you need to know. This is why she is worth writing about. And I did a short profile on her as one of the Texas 20 that year. And of course, uh, nine months later, uh, she's dead. And, uh, you know, I had one interview uh, on her bus before a gig in Austin to do this profile and was completely blown away. Just one is, is she, was, she hadn't gone on stage yet. She hadn't done her stage prep, no makeup. And I'm here to tell you, this is one of the most beautiful women I'd witnessed. I mean, I'm melting right there. I'm a reporter and I'm trying to get a story but she's already got me kind of like going like this. I just couldn't believe the natural beauty, which I never saw before in all her pictures and all of her stage gear. But she was so at ease and natural. And then over the next course of the next hour, talking about all kinds of things. And one is, it was very clear she was in control. 
because at one point her father, who was sitting on a, a bus bench nearby listening to us, volunteered something uh, to say something, and she said, hush, Dad, I'm talking. And she, this is her show. But it was very telling that what she really wanted to talk about was not so much the crossover that was in process. She was recording with English language producers. She was going to do an English language album. And it kept getting delayed because she was blowing up and she had so many demands on her time. But what she wanted to talk to me about was, you know, I've got these boutiques and I've got this fashion line that I'm fixing to roll out. And she showed me her sketches and talked about how much she loved fashion. And, you know, these were her businesses. And what really struck me long after the fact about that encounter is that was her thing. The, the boutiques and, and drawing, uh, you know, doing, creating a fashion line, that was all her deal. The band, Selena y Los Dinos, that was her dad's dream. He had Los Dinos. Abraham Quintanilla was in the original Los Dinos, who encountered frustrations because of this English-Spanish language divide and the cultural divides in, in Texas in the late 50s and early 60s. And so he never got to realize his dream. And early on, he taught his kids how to play, uh, how to perform. He named them Los Dinos after his band. And uh, what those kids did as they were growing up, from elementary school all the way to high school and beyond, was basically live out Abraham's dream. And Selena, who grew up in the family band as part of this, this was her life. The fashion thing was her, her deal. It was her one thing that she had, and that was hers. And it really made me, uh, it made me realize how hard it was the life she was living. When you're on the road, you're playing gigs, and certainly someone that's going to high school, junior high, she's never around for the dances or to date guys. She's out working every weekend. And, you know, it's a cloistered existence in a way, to which, you know, that sort of explains how Yolanda Saldivar appeared and, and you know, offered to be the fan club president and, and, and sort of by default became, if not one of Selena's best friends, her very best friend, because she was always there. So, so people don't think about that when you think about you know, a life in music, you know, performing and doing the, all this. It's hard. Uh, I've, I've managed bands and I've gotten to see this up close. It's really hard and it's wearing. And for the family unit to stay together and for them to work as they did as a family, it's, it's, it's a, a, an admirable feat. But I also know that it was like, you know, this woman didn't have a uh, childhood most of us had. She was busy performing. You said that fashion was her dream. What did you get from her in that regard as to what she wanted to do with that dream? Well, uh, my sense was, I mean, and she made it clear to me, fashion's my dream. This is what I've always wanted to do. This is what I used to sketch as a kid. And I, you know, it's kind of going beyond dolls and getting serious. And it did get serious. There, were, there was a boutique that was opened in Corpus, and then one uh, uh, famously on, on Broadway Street. Very prestigious location. And it wasn't just fashion designs or things she liked. She was starting up a fashion line. She had met Martin Gomez, a fashion designer, and he was working at Dillard's. And it's like when these two people met, it was like fellow travelers. They both had, you know, the same, same exuberance for, you know, sketching and, 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 you know, doing dresses and things like this. And so Martin kind of came aboard and they were developing a line that was going to be manufactured in Monterey. And this was getting, you know, it was beyond the boutiques. This was going to be any department store would have fashions by Selena and they would have her dress line in it, most of which were done by Martin and Martin did a lot of her state. He, he designed her stage wear, but it was also, it was, but it was always with Selena's input. So it wasn't like Martin's just doing these things. Hey, Selena, look at this. It, it was truly a collaborative venture. And so that's the creative part of it. And then the other creative aspect is there, she's running a business. She's running two businesses. There's a lot of money going through these businesses. People are, they know about it. It's kind of, they're kind of famous. They're not just boutiques. They're, this is Selena's boutique. She's kind of, she's, she's known 
in certain quarters that she's already a superstar. So people are going just to look at what she's got to, to sell. And this is a powerful thing. I mean, if she didn't have her music career, this might have been, and it could have been her whole life. But she also, at the same time, had this music career that was just beginning to go crazy. She, it was expanding so rapidly. And capital EMI is, is, is set the best producers in the world on her. And she's working all kinds of different sessions. People are hearing about her. They know about her. And when I talked to her on that bus, I, I remember walking out and telling someone at Texas Monthly, uh, you know, uh, hey, she's not just going to be the next Gloria Stefan. And I think she's going to be a lot bigger than Gloria Stefan. Uh, but she's, she's, you know, Madonna better watch out because that's what kind of pop sensibility she had. And, you know, I don't care what language she was singing at, she, what language she was singing in at the Astrodome in Houston, but 70,000 fans can't be wrong. I mean, that's, when you see the, the Astrodome concert shortly before uh, uh, she passed, that's really seeing her at the height of not just her her singing abilities and performing abilities, stage presence, but just her connection with the fans. I mean, she had it going on. And this is what really hurts is to see that and to see this this ascent, this, this upward curve, and you know it's going so much higher, but instead it's just cut off. And that's the sad part. She became famous in death. Selena became famous in death but I'm here to tell you, had she lived, she would have been a lot bigger than she is right now. Her death uh, was such a profound experience, and it started for me with a phone call about 11 or 11.30 that day from my friend David Bennett, who was a reporter at the San Antonio Express News. He always had some kind of bad jokes, and it was like, Selena's been shot, and I said, David, you're a day ahead of April Fool's, and that's not very funny. And he said, no, it just came over the wire. Really? And there was nothing else. And then uh, uh, probably about 45 minutes passed and David called again and said, she's dead. And uh, I was just stunned. I mean, I you know, you take it personally and it's, I don't know, I, I interviewed her once, but it's just, it, it was just like getting cold cocked. And David called back later and said, there's a, uh, there's a candlelight vil vigil at uh, sunken gardens tonight I think six six o'clock I didn't even hesitate I got in my car and went down there to see and before I went to sunken gardens I went over to the boutique and it was pretty interesting I'd never been to the boutique before but it was like big and you know, man she wasn't kidding when she's talking it up and it was there and there were like uh, someone had left a flower there maybe a rose and a note card and I went to this sunken gardens and it was just, you're walking around with all these people in the dark. They're holding these candles with a piece of paper so it didn't, the wax didn't drip on, on you. And they all just have this stunned look. They don't know what they're there for. They're waiting for someone to tell them what to do. I went back after the end of the vigil uh, to the boutique. And it was probably closer to 10 o'clock then. And I'd seen the veneration happen because all of a sudden, the front of the boutique had flowers, it was covered balloons, all these notes and messages. In the course of just a few hours, people had felt compelled to go somewhere that was physically tied to Selena and, and express themselves. That was on uh, a Friday night. Um, I stayed at home Saturday and I, and I told, I remember telling David, I said, I'm gonna let this sit, but I'll, I'll, I'll call Mr. Quintanilla. And David called me back later and said, he's doing a press conference right now. So he was already out there, and I thought, well, you know, I, I need to go. And so Sunday morning, uh, while the service at San Fernando Cathedral was playing on the radio live, I drove uh, down to San Antonio, picked up David, and we went to Corpus. And we stopped. First stop was at the Days Inn in Corpus Christi, where she had been shot and where she had been killed. And it was the same. There were people out on the in the inner uh, courtyard of the Days Inn uh, with that same stunned look. You know, they're there, they had to be there. They don't know why. Some kid came up to me and said, I just hitchhiked from Detroit. He's kind of out of breath. I don't know what I'm doing here, but I had to come here. 
with people were going around looking in the grass and I think looking for, you know, flecks of blood. People were following the path from the room where she was shot all the way across the, the swimming pool into the registration desk, the office, where she collapsed and died. And it, it just was this kind of sense, something happened, we're here, but we don't know why. I was in seventh grade in Fort Worth, Texas when John F. Kennedy got shot. John, John F. Kennedy, President Kennedy was in Fort Worth that morning. I can remember the headlines of the paper, welcome to Fort Worth, Mr. President. And by lunchtime, there's people crying in the cafeteria. And uh, by an hour later, someone's pointing across the street. Uh, that happens to be the house of uh, Marina, or, or Marguerite Oswald, the mother of the accused assassin. And there's all these Fort Worth ties. Lee Harvey Oswald was a few years ahead of me in high school. And that was like this dark day and people, it was the bomb went off again. They don't know what to do. All these people walking around and trying to express themselves with sentiments. And I saw this again with Selena, but it was, to me, it was within one of the two parallel universes of South Texas. Because, you know, there's Anglo-American Texas and there's Mexican-American Texas, and they intermingle. Sometimes they meet at the mall or uh, on the highway or whatever, but sometimes they're parallel universes. They're very separate. And so, you know, all of a sudden, I'm on that drive from San Antonio to Corpus that Sunday morning, you saw the cars with the headlights on, and you saw the messages written in shoe polish on the windows, all referring to Selena, we love you, where we're from, uh, we miss you, uh, uh, Siempre Selena, all these, all these messages. And yet, uh, I remember coming back to Wimberley and there was a Anglo woman who I knew because there, she had a son about at one of the ages of my sons. She was from Referio, Anglo woman from Referio. And she said, and I'd said I'd been working on the Selena story and she said, uh, I never heard of Selena. I don't know who she is. And I grew up with those people. And I thought, right then I said, you know, in my mind, this book's for you, lady. Those pe and this book is also for those people, these people, because no one was writing about this. And, you know, there were newspaper reports and there were some, there were some pretty uh, uh, fantasy-driven books that... Uh, uh, masked themselves as serious pieces of work that weren't. And yet I felt, I felt a responsibility in a way to tell this story about how South Texas works, how this Tejano music business works for all these people that grew up around these people but didn't ever hear of Selena, but also for the people that didn't have that written history. So this gave me an opportunity to write about things that I, I knew but hadn't written about before, like, you know, to tell little Joe's story and his role in basically creating, being the standard bearer of Tejano music and working with Cesar Chavez. I'm working on, on this book. I got to meet Johnny Herrera, who, El Suspiro. He was a big uh, crooner who had a hit. He was in Corpus, but he had a hit, a hit in Mexico, which Texas acts never made it over into Mexico because Tejanos were considered pochos, you know, country bumpkins. They're not real Mexicanos. They can't even speak the language well. So, you know, we, we were put down. So to, to meet El Suspiro, who had a hit and was a star in Mexico, and then he tells me the story about mentoring Abraham uh, Quintini and actually making the first recording, tape recording, on a little recorder of Selena and saying she was not very good. She learned to do what she did. This was not instant talent. She, she worked hard at it. Man, you know, that, this unfortunate event gave me the chance to write about so many things that I wouldn't have gotten to write about otherwise and to tell these stories that even today, it blows my mind how some people, just the lack of understanding there is, don't you get it? This is, you know, this is our culture. Texas's culture is, is we're, not, we're not the South. The South is bi-ethnic. It's African-American, Anglo-American. Texas, especially South Texas, is tri-ethnic. And you know, we're as much Mexican American as Anglo American and African American, even more so. And it just I, I still can't get over the ignorance of some people about what's in around them, what's here. Don't you have ears? Can't you hear this music? 
Do you not, have you never heard a polkita that made you want to kind of get up and bounce? You know, I, I, I kind of feel sorry for people that have kept, been so cloistered that they didn't know who Selena was. And I felt compelled since her death to really continue to try to tell that story because I think it's a, it's an amazing story of a woman that was determined, that succeeded against so many odds, and was this role model uh, when there were no role models. And she remains that today. In Selena Spear, uh, I mean, was Yolanda just off the radar in terms of what she was capable of? You know, Yolanda was kind of an unknown entity when she shows up and she says she wants to be Selena's fan club president. They didn't have a fan club president. Things were going, they were getting big. And this is kind of like found offer, you know. Sure, why not? And you know, there wasn't like background checks run or anything and not much known. And you know, when you hear of Yolanda's story and she had a past and it was sort of checkered. She had embezzled a little bit. Uh, she had really had a hard time working professionally as a nurse. Uh, and by making this, uh, you know, outreach, uh, a whole world opened up to Yolanda that she had never, I mean, she, this woman was small in stature, kind of chunky, mousy looking, kind of person you walk past her, you're not going to think twice about who you saw. Pretty forgettable. And all of a sudden through her association with Selena as her fan club president, She's backstage at these gigs and 5,000 people are yelling and everybody wants a piece of Selena and she's the gatekeeper. And she became part of the, the entourage in a way until Selena had put her in charge of the San Antonio boutique. And that's when things started going awry as far as anyone was aware of. No one was aware that she was skimming off the t-shirt sales or fan club memberships. But once she got into the boutique, uh, that's a business and there's records kept, and there's accounting done, and there's a way to do things and not do things. And, and I think Martin Gomez was the first one to, something's not right. And I think it's when he figured out, uh, did, ran some numbers and, you know, she, uh, Yolanda took a collection up for a ring for Selena to give to Selena and had made to Selena. And it was the ring Selena took off one of her last acts before Yolanda shot her. But Yolanda took uh, these contributions in and then she charged it to the American Express card. So she's already double dipping. And Martin recalled telling her, her telling him about this fantastic thing she wanted to make for Selena, this jewelry piece that just sounded like bigger, larger, crazier than anyone imagined. And he just thought, you know, this isn't right. And he went, to the family to tell them. And, um, and I, I talk, he went to Suzette, who was in charge, basically she was uh, working with the fan club and fu doing fulfillment, and to Abraham, who was uh, Selena's father and manager. And Martin went and said, I don't think things are right here. And he, he kind of thought Yolanda was delusional. She was talking crazy stuff. And started realizing, talking to the employees at the boutique, and how, you know, she was really hard to work with, wouldn't show, she was very secretive, uh, kept her cards very close to herself. And uh, it was through this that they start doing an accounting of the fan club. And she's been stealing from us. And Abraham and Suzette directly confronted Yolanda. You've been stealing from us and you're gonna pay for this. Now, at that point, uh, I look back and that's kind of a crucial, turning point, they didn't fire her. She was kept around for about three weeks before the murder. And it was always, we're, we're gonna settle this and the police are gonna have their day with you and all this. In the meantime, she's trying to, she's going back and forth to Monterey uh, to try to you know, finalize this fashion line. Uh, so she's, she's doing a lot of things, but clearly what I saw in the, in the chronology is after being threatened, we're gonna get you and all that, she went to uh, uh, a place to shoot and got a gun. And she kept that gun for about uh, a week and she took it back, had second thoughts. But then less than a week before 
she did the deed, she got the gun again. And I'm, I'm convinced the first time at least was she thought she was protecting herself against these threats from Abraham. And Selena would never believe what Abraham and Suzette were saying. Yolanda wouldn't do that, she's my best friend. And I don't think Selena ever believed Yolanda did anything wrong until that morning, about two hours before um, um, she was shot. Because uh, she had taken, she was so concerned Yolanda had claimed she had made up a story about being raped in, in Monterey. And so Selena took her to the hospital and the nurse came out and said, there was no, she was not sexually assaulted. And Selena was there to get bank records that Yolanda had been holding on to and been kind of dodging. So that's why she had showed up to even before she took her to, to the hospital to check her out for rape. She was supposed to get these records. And Yolanda had delayed those a few times. So I think it's just it, these unfortunate circumstances. They didn't get rid of Yolanda. She had time, too much time to think about it and to fantasize and to, to perceive threats, whether the threat was from Ab Abraham, or I think that very last time Selena removes the ring, it's, it's a crime of passion. If I can't have you, if I can't be your best friend, if I can't be next to you, no one can have you. And of course, the minute she shot her, uh, she regretted everything. She went to the truck and had the gun to her temple and was crying the whole time. She, she, it, it was in a fit in a, in a minute not even a minute that that happened, and it shouldn't have happened. I, in all these little stages, you think, well, what if, and what if? But it happened, and it will always be forever thus. She will always make it to a very young age, but never be able to mature into middle age. She was telling me about how she was so excited. Chris and her had bought, uh, Chris and she had bought property outside of Corpus, on the other side of South Padre Allen Drive in the country on some acreage, and, and we're going to raise chickens and raise babies. That's what she told me. So, you know, she's frozen in time, living at this family compound, three houses all behind one chain, chain link fence, but knowing where she was going, what she was doing, what her plans were, and just basically the, how much of an open book she was to just kind of like bring it. And she was going to address it and take it on. That's what, it, it, it's frustrating to to just think of a life like that because it is what it is. It, it's frozen. She's frozen in time. And it's, it's a great story to, to learn and, and hear, but it's not the story it should have been. So this happens in 95 and then you get invested in the book in 95, finish it in early 96. And so you wrap that up. What did you think would happen? once your book was over with her story? Like, you know, I don't, I don't know what would have happened. I mean, I had no expectations when I wrote my, the book. It's just, I knew I had a story and um, it was not just profiling her, but when she was shot, Texas Monthly was working on a gun issue, all about guns. And so I show up on the office on Monday afternoon after my second trip to Corpus and I said, I think I got a story for a gun issue. And it was even, we, you know, I never talked about, you know, every writer wants their story to be on the cover. And I, I went so bold as to say, uh, I know this is out of my purview, but this really should be a cover story. If you see the reaction that I've been seeing. Well, we never have had a Hispanic female on the cover. I think Lena Guerrero had been on the cover for uh, embezzling money from the Texas lottery. I mean, when, when Hispanics have been featured in Texas Monthly, it was usually for doing something bad. And here was something good. And I, I got in a heated argument. Well, they put her on the cover. And it became the best-selling single newsstand issue, except for the sesquicentennial special issue. And they'd printed up enough copies for that. They sold out of copies. And my hope was that, you know, finally the general media, the general market's going to get what's going on here. And they're going to start covering it and treating it with respect and all that. And I thought, you know, my book, I wanted the book to legitimize a lot of this. And, 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 and I, I, was, I was with Little Brown, a major American publisher, and went back and forth with him and, and so many times. And finally, because uh, I wanted a Spanish edition. Never mind that Selena grew up Anglo, grew up speaking English first and having to learn her culture and her language later 
as a performer. But, you know, I'm just thinking that this is, this is a great story and that people should hear it. So the article sold so well. And again, it would have been the best-selling issue had they estimated properly and ordered up enough copies. And that just made, that made me proud. It's like, you know, this is, this is Texas too. And I just wanted, you know, so I wanted to carry it out with the book and tell her story and also kind of the history of Mexican-American music in Texas. And I did that and I achieved it. But, you know, I couldn't get Little Brown to publish in Spanish. And finally, the, the final word after going back and forth for three months is, well, Little Brown has never published a book in Spanish. And I can tell you today, they have since. I mean, I, I had to do some, I don't want to call it trailblazing, but being the first to try to tackle a bicultural subject like this and deal with it in, in the English language, mainstream media, uh, uh, was not easy because I had to do more than my share of explaining. And, and I still, it still blows my mind how the, the general market doesn't get it. But, you know, I, I got it and, I, and the book's there. And I was very pleased about a year after the book comes out, uh, I get a call and would I appear on the Christina show? Univision, I mean, this is, this, is, this is Oprah of Latin America. Sure, so I flew to Miami and it was a gathering of Selena book authors. And I remember meeting uh, there first before we, we even did the, the taping, uh, Maria Celeste Araras, who had a book, Selena's Secret. She's a, 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 a personality on uh, Telemundo. And during the Selena's trial, whenever M Maria Celeste would walk outside the courthouse, she's the one that would get all the cheers from the crowd. She's a real looker and all this. So she wrote a book, but it was based on Yolanda's secret, which was completely bogus. Yolanda made this up at the trial at the very end. By the way, I have a secret. So is that going to get her any leniency? No, it didn't. So Maria Celeste is there and a couple other authors. And I'm here to say, I mean, these other books were based on fantasy, folklore, magic, and, and things, they were not based on fact. And at the end of this taping, um, they bring up a, a book critic from Puerto Rico. I never met any of these people before, uh, but he says that my book is the one legitimate book. That it, you know, if you want to learn the story, the factual story of Selena, here's this book. And it made me really proud because, you know, I'm, I'm having to get uh, dubbed because my Spanish is poor enough. I need to have someone translate in English for me. And, and it's very confusing when you're hearing the dubbing and then you're hearing the Spanish. Uh, but I felt proud that I, I did that. And so I went back to Texas. Next day, I'm at Texas Monthly. I flew home. And at Texas Monthly, no one in the office says anything. No one knows Univision. No one knows Selena. I had the same experiences you did as far as talking to my Anglo editors at Texas Monthly. This is an important story. And, you know, through fortunate circumstances, getting her on the cover for what was already being laid out as a gun issue. And here's the gun story. Here's the best gun story of them all. And it, was, it, it set a single issue newsstand sales records for the magazine. It was only topped by the sesquicentennial issue and they'd printed enough copies for that. They didn't, they underestimated the print run for this. And I remember that and to see the people reaction, People Magazine kind of got it and they were jumping on it. But yeah, here, getting a call from a reporter friend of mine at Express News on Friday, it wasn't even noon yet. She's been shot. A subsequent call, she's dead. And then they're having a vigil. And to see, the, the veneration is what got me. And that was something that kind of transcended Kennedy. People did leave roses and expressions, but this, is, this became a Hispanic thing. So I saw a, a veneration that night, Friday night, at Selena Etc. Boutique on Broadway. I went there before the vigil. There were like one or two things left at the door. And when I came back, the whole front of the building was covered. The days in, same thing. People figured out which hotel room and they're covering it with all these things. And it, it also on um, the chain link fence outside the Quintanilla family's compound. And that one got taken down pretty quick. Their Jehovah's Witnesses and this kind of veneration did not fit with, you know, the, those, the tenets of that faith. But, 
you see it happening and it's like, you know, this is like, this is a living thing. And where I look at the veneration and what happened then, and we look at the passage of time to now, uh, the veneration continues. And I would argue today, certainly as it, with demographics being what they are, uh, Selena may be bigger than Frida Calho now. Uh, she's not going to knock La Virgen off the top of the charts, but she's bubbling under. And it's that kind of thing because people, you know, look at her role model, good person, uh, uh, good qualities, uh, a successful female, uh, killed for all the wrong reasons, for trusting, you know, at the hand of your best friend. Uh, all these circumstances are such that it just, it really feeds into something that I saw when I went back to Corpus recently. And when I've talked to people about Selena again, everybody will tell their story or, you know, I heard her records or, or I got to see her play or, or my daughter turned me on to her or whatever. But when they say the story, it always ends with, it's so sad. And it's one of these, I mean, this is a, a it's a great, the great Latin tragedy. They go back to Cortez showing up and you think this guy's the savior and instead he wipes out your people. But there's a sadness that permeates the culture that I think that her death speaks to. And it's not just the music. If you try to explain it to people, well, you know, she hadn't done that much music and it was Tejano and uh, how do you explain that to people still? You can't explain Selena with just listening to her music or even just watching her music videos. You have to understand the place and time and the context. And, you know, great to have success with Bitty Bitty Bomb Bomb. I would argue that the more bigger success was singing that Coca-Cola commercial because no Latina had done that yet. And here she was, she was picked by this, the biggest soft drink brand in the world and you're going to be our spokesperson. All the other Tejano bands were getting beer deals, but you know, this is separate. So, you know, I, I just look at the whole package in that uh, a female in a real male dominated business, Tejano more so than most music, and music is generally male dominated, certainly the business aspect. Um, she was fortunate to have uh, a manager who happened to be her father because he looked out for her. I remember interviewing Laura Canales, who in the 70s was considered, she was kind of like Selena, the bright uh, female vocalist of Tejano music. And I met her, she was, uh, she was becoming a speech therapist at Texas A&I Kingsville. She said, I'm trying to teach my people how to say chicken instead of chicken. And I, I just thought that was a beautiful thing. But Pat's, uh, Laura said, I wish I would have had someone like Abraham uh, looking out for me because I wouldn't have gotten beat up and abused like I did in the business and I, w I would I might still be in the business today. So Selena had, you know, her father looking out after her and he was going to protect her. But to be a young female to grow up in this business and to come of age and to hear her music, I mean, you hear a recording from 87 or so when she started winning Tejano Awards and then, you know, her last recordings were such a creative art. She, she was always getting better. And I was, uh, uh, Johnny Herrera, who was uh, El Suspiro in the 50s, he ran a record shop in uh, Corpus and he mentored both Abe and, and did one of Selena's first recordings. Johnny went out of his way to say, this girl was not talented. And he wanted to make the point that everything that she was in 1994, 1995 was learned and earned and it was hard. Everything, I mean, learning Spanish, how to sing properly. I watched those uh, uh, recordings of Johnny Canales interviewing her and he teases her about her Spanish. And then Selena goes off to Monterey, takes lessons and comes back and kind of gives it back to him. So, you know, she was just, this, it, it, it's, uh, it's a great American story of basically struggling from nothing. The family's poor and they become this, this beacon, this representative of, of, of a people, of a culture. And really, kind of so many hopes and dreams are resting on her success. And, and she had worked for, I think when I interviewed, she said 12 years, and it was a way to put food on the table, and she didn't like the music at first. Um, and people don't realize that part, that she had developed, even though she was very young, an ongoing relationship with a big part of the crowd, a big part of the audience. Oh, that, that came from the little girl singing on stage and being a novelty. 
that she attracted people and she stood out. Um, there weren't that many young females doing Tejana. So as she gets better, as she becomes a teenager, and then as she becomes a young woman, uh, we're all growing up with her. I mean, if you've been watching her that far, and you know, it's, it's, you're excited because you know where this is gonna go. It's not gonna just, you know, go like that. It's gonna keep going until, but then the death stops it. it everything stopped in time. Are you surprised that, it, that it's gone on this way? Or is, you know, that there's such a big thing in the 25th, the 20th, the Cuomo floor in, in uh, Corpus, or, and is that part of the family's cultivation of that and, and making sure that legacy stayed I, I, The family has been very protective about Selena's image and rightfully so and very careful. I've gotten crosswise with them for writing a book um, but I respect you know what they have done and what they pulled off over 25 years and the fact that there's the museum in, in the recording studio Q Productions uh, I think that's important because people need places to touch uh, where she was, where, and you know, uh, you can't find the days in today and the room number has been changed and there's no way, there's no evidence at all. And you know, there's the gazebo, you can go there and you go to the cemetery, you go to the Selena Auditorium, but there's really not that many places to touch and the studio is it. So. I, I applaud them for, for keeping, you know, being good guardians of the image. How about, are you surprised that this thing moved from Corpus to San Antonio or not? Um, you know, this, that's the other part of it. It's, it's hard running a business um, and, and the entertainment business, even when you're protecting the image of someone who's passed, it's still the music business. So uh, when I visited Corpus, uh, a couple months ago, I just got a sense, and I hadn't been back, but I've been in and out a few times, but I hadn't been back to look at Selena since, you know, all this went down. And uh, I just got the sense Corpus had not progressed that much. And it's, and you know, I kept thinking, you know, I always think, why is this city that's by, you know, Padre Island and, you know, all this fishing and all this, this coastal stuff, it's really pretty. Why doesn't it progress? There's, there remains a brain drain today. The best and brightest leave. And, and even, even if that brain drain means they just moved to San Antonio because it's a bigger stage. And that's what that, the moving of Como La Flor indicates to me is when one of the biggest corporate citizens of Corpus Christi, Sitgo, declines to be the sponsor of the next Como La Flor. What, you guys don't have money? To me, that's, that's like, that was a diss. So in a way, it should have moved somewhere where there's more reception. And there's also the sense of bigger stage that I always got the sense, talking to Selena and just knowing the way things were going. And that, that crossover album, that crossover album, had she been alive to enjoy it and to promote it, uh, I think might have taken her out of, out of here. She might have moved to LA. I do know, she told me, about, you know, when I'm interviewing her, she's still living in the family compound on Bloomington Street in the Molina. But uh, she told me Chris and her had bought acreage and they were gonna raise chickens and babies outside of town and they were really looking forward to it. So, and that sounded really sweet. And I gotta say that when I went to Corpus, it just looked more like a port town, a little beat down. The ballpark was nice, but you know, Whataburger Field, Whataburger moved, they, they moved to San Antonio. so. You know, you, you begin to think, you know, it's just, was this too small of a stage? And would this have held her for much longer? I, I'm not sure. She was as much of San Antonio when she passed as she was of Corpus. Was it part of the story is the what if that, that uh, you know, her dreams were talking about acting. When I interviewed her, she was talking about eh, Johnny Depp in the movie. You know, but that's far, far down the road. I, I really will have some goals before that. And she, well, she, look, she made it into a telenovela in Mexico. She, she was a, I, I really believe she was this person by this time in her life and had been working in entertainment long enough. Show me what you got. Give me what you got. I'll take it and I'll, I'll, I'll make it happen. And she was that person. I mean, she had that potential. She could have been an actress. She could have been great. Uh, there's all... I try not to play the what ifs, but 
in her case, just knowing where she was at, making that crossover album and knowing where things were, uh, it was just, it was a matter of a few months and everything would have been crazy and wild. And, and I'm trying to remember, we ran into her in LA when she was out there, was it for the Grammys, the Latin Grammys or something? I don't even remember what time it was, but that, that was the next day and she was looking forward to the English stuff because that's what her ultimate goal was. And uh, I don't think people realize that either. It was very interesting at that period of time, she's going to Latin Grammys in LA. She's, known, she's a known entity in LA, she's selling well. And she's also one of the few uh, Tejano artists or anyone in the West Coast to make it in Miami and uh, when, they, when she played Calle Ocho and started drawing huge crowds. This was transcending the Tano envelope. And very few acts have been able to do that historically. And she was starting to do that. So uh, it's just, you, you just, when you start thinking about, it, there's a momentum and I'm following it and you just wanna follow it through and you don't get to. So you can't help but think, dang, uh, and play a little what if, but you also, it's tempered with, this is what happened. And it's a terrible thing, but there is a legacy here that's worth uh, revisiting and honoring. And in my mind, this is a person worth venerating, mm -hmm. a, a figure, a public figure, a symbol, an icon, whatever you want to call her. Because she's that now as much as she is a person. And it's, it's this role model. And, you know, the, the hardest thing in playing what if is, uh, you start thinking, well, what about the next Selena? And then it's like, no, mm -hmm. <laughs> not going to happen. Uh, forget that. Don't play that game. Was it because of the charisma, the personality as well? Because anybody could be, I don't want to say anybody, she said, I remember in an interview, anybody can be a role model, but she had a connection. So I like to think when I'm a reporter and I'm doing an interview, even a, you know, interviewing a music person, this is not that hard, but I'm going to be, I'm going to do my business. And I melted just in her presence. And this was a talent that I kind of started to glean that she could be in a room and there's 10 people in here and she's going to know who the record company president is in this room. She's going to work them. But she's also going to see that little old lady in the corner that no one's talking to. And she may work her first. That was, she was the completest. And it's not like, yeah, I've got business to do. No, we're people. And she was a real people person. And just, you know, you're, you, you're in that gaze. It's like, what do you want? Like, I'll give you whatever you want. Because it really was just, uh, and seeing her without her makeup on before she went on stage. I tried to get John Dyer, who, who shot the session for her when she was in the Texas 20, to get her without her makeup. And he tells the story about the knockdown drag out he had with her and her dad fighting and he just finally gave up. Okay, go do what you want. Mm -hmm. And they did. And they're, they're really great shots. But I'm here to tell you if, you, if you think this is a beautiful person all made up and dolled up, you should have seen her without her makeup on. And now, speaking of Abraham, you talk about uh, that it was good for her to have him and, and all that, but still the tension and the control. You didn't see Chris at the thing yesterday. He's not going to be at the tribute. He's not going to have his TV series done. He was developing one too. This, there's a lot of misfortune out of this. And I wrote about it in, in the book. I made the observation that it was not long after she had passed that Chris signed over uh, executor rights to Abraham. And it's since cost Chris as far as his ability to, to execute some ideas that he wanted to do, including a, a television series he had sketched out. Uh, it was a, that was a contentious relationship. Uh, and it was kind of, you know, this is what life is like inside the Los Dinos bubble. Because, you know, all through junior high and high school, Every weekend that they're having a dance in, in Corpus at the high school, or the junior high or a party, Selena's not there, she's working. She doesn't know this, her life is in this bubble. So, you know, you basically have to operate in this bubble and Abraham is a strong, forceful presence and that you had to have a manager, someone fronting for you like that period. It happened to be her father. When I was doing the interview on the bus, this was for the Texas 20, it was outside of a club in downtown Austin. At one point, and Abraham sit, and, and Marcella are sitting on the 
bus bench. And Selena said something, and Abraham kind of interjected, and she said, hush, Dad, I'm talking. And you want to play the what-if game? She's fixing to do an English-language crossover. The record label was not going to allow the same business infrastructure to continue representing Selena. That would have changed. Uh, would she have moved to Miami, New York, L.A.? Probably if she wanted to pursue acting as well. There were so many demands on her time uh, towards the end, and yet she was addressing every demand and kind of she was stepping up to it and doing it. And then there was the fashion line. What would have happened there? Uh, and that was going to be based in Monterey. She was doing a, a, a telenovela in Monterey, and there was speculation she was going to move to Monterey. She really liked Monterey, and that, that was kind of late in the game that she discovered this city that was, you know, it's like six hours from Corpus. You drive there, and then all of a sudden, this is real Mexico, and it's a huge city, and, and, and you know, there's, there's a, a cultured gentry, and she learns how to speak proper Spanish among these people. Uh, that was a real eye-opener. But so if I was going to speculate, and that's a, a dangerous game, when you're talking about Selena, um, she would have moved from Corpus and probably from San Antonio. My guess is she would have gone to a bigger city that could have handed her, handled her celebrity. As Abraham gets older, um, do you think there'll be less of that? I mean, I don't know how I'm between Suzette maybe and, and Chris, but you, do you feel for Chris because he's out of that loop? I do and I don't. I mean, Chris, Chris has got a pretty good career. Mm -hmm. he's, he's married, he has kids. Um, and, uh, you know, I know, I know through uh, my friend Adrian Casada, they've been do working on some stuff. So, like, he's got his life, and, and, and he's good with it. I mean, sure, there's, you know, there were some bad things done, and, uh, and I think he got the short end of the stick in many respects. But that was that. that. That was then. He's moved on, and Abraham continues to manage his biggest act. Uh, Q Productions has taken on other acts, but it's Selena. That's what, what it's about. And when I really look at the whole of, of Tejano music, so much of it today is more, it's, it's more Norteño from Northern Mexico. And it kind of regressed back to a, a Norteño sound rather than this sophisticated new sound that all these labels thought was gonna be the next thing since reggae to sell here. I mean, they really were, all the labels thought were betting heavy on Tejano. But at the time, I mean, that was the peak of it with Selena. It was still, you know, you had a lot of synthesizers and kind of not as high tech production. It would have had to go to that next level to stay. And it seemed like after that it did. Well, with Tejano and, and with Selena's band, they, they didn't start with one, but they, they would bring in an accordion. So there was kind of like a, a retro movement back to the roots of what Tejano was. And that was there, but I think most Dinos were headed, you know, they were into, this was, you know, this was Madonna territory or Michael Jackson territory with the dance squad, uh, you know, with all the things. She had a big production going. And I think that was, they wanted to take it that direction. They wanted to be a, a pop dance band. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to be necessarily Tejano anymore. That was their core audience. But I don't think that they were burdened by this is holding us back. I think this was weird in Selena's world because she's flying off to Atlanta, uh, to these to LA to do these sessions with, you know, a record company, studio musicians, and then she's back at home with her family band. And AB's kind of bitching that uh, we're getting cut out of this this crossover business, and we'd like to have a hand in it too. So there was some tension there that was might have wound up pulling things apart. But it didn't. Mm -hmm. Is there still, uh, and I'm running into it right now, still that Anglo-Hispanic split where I'm having to explain, <laughs> this is still kind of a big story. We need to do something with this. Do you, do you see that? You still have to explain it to people. Why? It's just been dead 25 years. It was to hunt music. When I wrote that book uh, that came out in 1996, part, part of my goal was, was to explain to both sides of what I call our parallel universes of, of, of South Texas. I wanted to write a history for Mexican Americans about their music and about this artist. And I also wanted to explain, be a splainer to all, all, all those that referred to Mexican Americans in South Texas as those people. And uh, I found that the gap is, is not as broad as it, 
as it has been. And there's more comfort in many ways with just, you know, our, our biculture, uh, our bicultural, bilingual uh, uh, being that we are. This is, this is who we are as a people. And, but I'm still, we're still dealing with immigration issues. So I don't know. Uh, uh, in some ways, it's, gotten, it's kind of recently gotten worse. But I really like to think that uh, one of the great things Selena did was leaven those differences and you know, make us all realize we're all, we're all Texans, or if we're all speaking Spanish, we're all Tejanos. I'm a Tejano, even though I might not look like a Tejano. But if you, if you, if you absorb the culture and, you, and you, you embrace it, yeah, it's part of who you are. And we're coming along more, and there have been uh, some pretty interesting artists since, and I keep paying attention, keep waiting for that next, but uh, there's been nothing like uh, the phenomenon we witnessed when Selena y los Dinos were riding high, Tejano music was the thing, and uh, the possibilities were unlimited. It seems like, just a couple last quick questions. Uh, as I remember, when, before I got there uh, in the 80s, heavy metal was yeah. the thing. Yeah. And then that kind of waned, and there was a Tejano that filled the vacuum, but as she said, it was, it was for people like her that didn't speak Spanish and they were kind of getting back to their roots. And so it was bringing in more people that way, whether they consider themselves Hispanic or not, they weren't taught at school. They may have spoken, spoken Spanish in the home, but some of them are second, third, fourth generations. And so they were kind of getting back into that. And that's what it was growing up of anyway. It wasn't like, I don't wanna say Mexican American, first generations, people from Mexico. This was- American kids. American kids, yeah. No, it, you know, I think of it kind of like an accordion bellows. It, it, it expands and contracts. And, you know, you go back to the 1940s and early 50s, there was like uh, Beto Villa and Isidro Lopez, and they're doing big band music that's popular, like Glenn Miller and all that, but they're singing in Spanish. And what little Joe did, he started doing R&B, and Sonny, Sonny Ozuna, Sonny and the Sunliners, did a lot of R&B singing in English and both those acts, they kind of hit as English, ang Eng English language acts first. And then after about five years, they do like Los Dinos. They start singing everything in Spanish and we're, 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 we are addressing our specific audience. Never mind the rest. We're not going for the general market anymore. So it's always been these e efforts to kind of expand and then it contracts. And what was happening in the late 80s and early 90s is Tejano was on this expansion where there was really in the business of music, people were thinking, is this the next sound? Is, you know, just like a reggae coming out of Jamaica, regionally specific, but it becomes a pop sound. And it didn't, it stopped. Emilio was trying to do it as a Nashville act. Uh, uh, La Mafia were trying to be international and very sophisticated. Grupo Maz was doing more of the traditional, almost Norteño stuff. But all that stopped with Selena's death. No one went forward, no one succeeded. The air went out of Tejano music. And even though today, I mean, Intocable will sell millions of copies and are hugely popular, and they're part of that Tejano lineage. Uh, they're almost like more of a reversion to Norteño. They're not a, a direct descendants of Selena y Los Dinos. Do you think if she would have lived again, what if that she would have kept Tejano going, even though she was crossing over, that Tejano would have gone to the next level. Had Selena lived, speculation again, I believe Tejano would have gone over in a big way, continued to go over, while Selena, as the artist, would cater to the two parallel universes. She's gonna do an English language album and do her pop stuff, but she was never gonna abandon what she had developed. And especially when you think that she could have abandoned anything uh, uh, to do with Mexican culture or Spanish language easily at the time that she was doing the crossover. But instead, she's, she's on a telenovela. She's on TV in Mexico. So it's like, what do you want? What's better? No, oh, they're all great. Do you and think uh, Tejano would have also gone, not just because she was keeping it alive, but and maybe gone more sophisticated with the influence of some of those producers that it wouldn't have stayed just the regional sound? You know, I, I think had she lived, 
maybe those producers that were working with her in the English language album would have sussed this out and, and wanted to come and play with this feel. I can make some differences here. And that's been forever thus with Tejano music. It's always been these kind of, you know, unknown producers that don't get recognized, but they came in. Bob Griever was a great example of like, you know, he was an Anglo, but he, he tapped into it early and he had, uh, he had big hits. He had, he had a, a blown and going label or, uh, you know, but they didn't get recognized. Had a name producer started showing up on this scene uh, to produce Maz or Amelia, that would have gotten a lot of attention. And it's, what's it gonna turn out to be? Uh, I think of the, uh, the ranchera that Selena sings in that Johnny Depp uh, movie. You know, she's a great, I never heard her sing like Lucha Villa, but she does there. And she's a great voice, and I think maybe she would have tried that style. She would have experimented with more different kinds of music. But, you know, at the end of the day, she would still be Selena, so you can't rub the Tejano off. And I compartmentalize a lot of things, and that's one of those deals where I put it aside. I wrote an article uh, that's appearing in the March issue of Cowboys and Indians magazine. It was kind of my reminiscence. And uh, it was like trying to relive a little bit of what happened, but also where it is now and, and capture it and s see what it is. And it's just uh, when you get back into it, then it's like, it is, it's sad. It's a sad story. And you can't, you can't help but get swept up in that. And just like, you know, and I'm, I'm not here for, you know, to play on the emotions, but it's just like, God, I forgot all about that. And then you start reliving it. So I've had visits. Uh, I've talked with Martin Gomez, who's trying to write a book. Um, and uh, Stephanie Bagara, I love speaking with her because she has a cover band called Bitty Bitty Banda. She's from Austin. Grew up Stone Tejano and, uh, and was working in, in the city of Austin music business division when she and her friends got together to do this thing and it won't stop. It was just like a, a goof at a club and they've traveled all over the United States, uh, overseas and it's this thing now and it was interesting for her to tell me that at first she doesn't look like Selena and there are many Selena tribute bands out there that women that do look like Selena. Stephanie does not. And at some point about a year into doing Bitty Bitty Banda and people going nuts over this and wanting to hear these songs, she decided, I'm going to be me now. So no bustier, none of the gear, and she plays it straight. But she said, uh, one of the first times she did this, a woman, she was playing in San Antonio, an older woman came up and she said, I know this must be hard for you to do this and people saying there'll never be another Selena, but you've got her spirit. And so, you know, those little stories, um, I don't know, they left me feeling like she's still out there. Uh, she's bigger than ever. And I like to think she's gonna, you know, as time passes uh, and uh, she'll knock Frida off the charts as, as an icon worthy of veneration. Uh, and, you know, you see it, <laughs> you see it, in, in, in gay clubs, when the drag queens come out, there's always a Selena now. Uh, you see it in so many different aspects of life that you just don't think. It, it's when Stripes sells the commemorative cups or HEB does t-shirts and they sell out. You know, that tells me this is stronger than ever. And it's going to continue because that story, even though I can play what if and think, God, it, must, it was, would have been that much more. The story that we have is an incredible story. And it's, it's one that you can't make up. And it, it remains this forever. And now some people are going to look at that and go, well, you know, it's just commercialization. I have heard, I actually, uh, on our Facebook page when we put something last, like, just let her die, or something like that. You know, just let it go, she's dead. Which is crass, or it seems crass, but on the other side, people might see it as commercialism that they're taking advantage of. Um, look, that, uh, the, the charge of commercialism has been constant. And that will come when your father is your manager. It's just business and business and art uh, mix together a lot. And, and you, you can't be pure one way or the other. So uh, I can see people say, oh, it's commercial. Uh, you could say uh, the film Selena was commercialism. And I remember uh, I got into a debate with Abraham Quintanilla on a radio station in Corpus and it was pretty heated. He said, you're, you're trying to live off my daughter. 
you're, you're trying to make money off my daughter. I said, Abraham, you're making a money. I mean, Abraham, you're making a movie for Warner Brothers. I'm doing this book for Little Brown, which is a Time Warner company. We're both working for the same people. And I think we have the same thing in mind. I want people to know who this woman was. You know, if I can get paid for it, great. But I'm not going out on the road and going to be doing shows. I'm a writer. I'm writing a book. I know books well enough. I ain't getting rich off this. This is more work than it's worth. But I want people to know this story because it's just, you know, I'm, I'm so lucky as a writer to have been in this place in this period of time and to be able to tell this story. And unfortunately, there were not others in my position to do the same. So I felt a responsibility. How about now? Do you, I mean, you wrote for Cowboys and Indians. And yeah. Do you, do you ever think of expanding or updating the book or writing another book? Um, last year, I took the time out and spent time and money and read my book as an audio book. And I still would like to get it translated into Spanish. I own the rights to it. Little Brown gave me the rights back. I was such an a uncomfortable person to be with about they didn't publish in Spanish. They just said, they gave me the book back. So I, I own it and I've been able to do a Kindle and I did a, a, an audio book. And I've thought about, you know, do you update, do you expand? And after reading the book, no, I mean, I, everything I said pretty much came to pass or, or I don't think I did too much predicting. I would have written it differently, but I don't know that I've got that, you know, much more to say about it other than this 25 years has passed and uh, uh, her, uh, her image, her, uh, the awareness of Selena is greater than ever. Uh, she's more distant than ever. To have seen the grave site shortly after her burial and to go see it today is different. It's been, it's matured. There's a little gate around her, her grave site so people can't get in into it and deface it. Um, there's a lot of graffiti on the bricks in her, her at Selena Memorial Gazebo. But you know what? These are just people want to say, I touched this. I was here. And uh, as I don't think it's something that's unique to the Hispanic culture in Texas to want to have that connection, that connectivity. But I do feel like it's, it's uh, exhibited in an overt, strong fashion. It's, it, people don't hide about that. And people are still sending messages to Selena. And they're still letting her know how she's inspired them or their children or someone in their family. And uh, it's just, you know, whether, you know, you don't have to say, I, like, I don't even like her music or whatever. That doesn't even matter. It's who's this figure, Selena, and uh, she's with us. And it's important to recognize her no matter how well you knew her. And I'm here to tell you, after writing about her and looking into her life and her story, she's going to be with you for the rest of your life.